Hello. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. I scared you. <laughs> Welcome back from the break. Um, really excited about this one. The next conversation is called Beyond the Engine Duopoly, Creating and Using Free Game Tools for Everyone. This is a conversation with Natalie Lawhead, V. Buckingham, and Emilio Coppola, moderated by the wonderful Sosasovsky. I'm just going to introduce everybody to you, and then we'll get started. Natalie Lawhead is a net artist and game designer who has been creating experimental uh, digital art since the late 90s. Their past works include titles such as the IGF-winning Tetra Get On Games, Everything is Going to Be OK, and the Electric Zine Maker. Hello. Um, great. Take a seat. A very specific seat. All right. Then we have V. Buckingham is the creator of Downpour, an app that makes it easy to make little games on your phone. Before that, she was the creator of Cheap Bots Done Quick, a website that made it easy to make little Twitter bots on your computer. She's also made things which were hard to use. Welcome, V. Thank you. Emilio Coppola is the creator of Dialogic, a tool to make visual novels using the Godot engine. Full-time working to support the growth and success of open source tools, currently executive director at the Godot Foundation. Everybody, welcome. Emilio, take a seat. And last but not least is Sososovsky, the mad scientist of video games, creator of McPixel, Thelemite, and a million other games nobody has ever heard about. He's a maniac of retro hardware and lover of new technology. Currently, Sos is on a quest to create the worst game ever, AKA the Mosh Pit Simulator. Thank you so much. Take it from here. Oh, one second. I'm going to read the talk bio as well, cause, just because it's part of the whole thing. Um, this is the right time to break free from the shackles of big corporate game engines. But are you alone in this journey? Surely not. With a team of game and tool creators, we will show you not only how, to can, how you can find a free video game engine or tool that will suit your needs, but also how you too can contribute to creating tools for other people to use. Everybody, give it up for this conversation. Hello, uh, my name is Sosasovsky. So uh, Ruth kind of took my first point from my list, which was to introduce ourselves one by one. Uh, you already know who we are, but let me just do a quick introduction into why are we doing this? Why are we having this conversation? Why are we here having this panel talking to you? Uh, as you all know, around late last year, Unity pulled a move, kind of pulled a rug from under the developers. They have shown us that we are, we should not fully trust big corporations who take single-handedly can destroy so many video games, so many cool things that we make, so many companies, so many developers just change their life because of one decision of a big corporate entity. So this is was kind of a uh, cold shower for the entire gaming industry. They have rolled back and changed the serious. rules that they imposed initially, but the kind of lack of trust remains. And what we want to talk to you about is that you do not have to be bound by the shackles of the corporate tools. There are tens, there are thousands of free tools to use, to make, you can use to make games that are more unique, that are more tools that are empowering to more developers that are more accessible, that are absolutely free, and you are not alone in the journey if you want to stop using Unity, if you want to stop using Unreal, if you want to use something that is free and accessible, there are many things that you can use, and there are many also things that you can do to help other people. So we, we will do, can we do the introductions again so everybody <laughs> says in their own words why they're here. My name is Sosasovsky. I have made a game called MacPixel 3 in my own engine from scratch released last 2022. Uh, it was ported to every single platform in existence, including MS-DOS and also PlayStation 5 and everything in between that. Uh, and it was written in C from scratch. So that is possible. You can do that. And that's why I'm here. Uh, hi. 
Um, so I'm V Buckingham, and yeah, I, I'm the creator of Downpour. So this is a tool that you can use to make games on your phone, and it's really trying to lower the distance between having a stupid idea and inflicting it on someone else. Um, so you don't need a laptop to do that. You can just, in the course of this talk, you could pull out your phone, sneakily start looking at it, download it from the App Store, um, combine some photos together and publish, I would estimate, about five complete games uh, in the course of this talk. Um, you know, also feel free to just, you know, listen to the talk instead. Um, but th that's, that's, that's what I'm about, and I, and I really care about that, like making tools that let other people make things. Um, because personally, it feels great for me to see other people make really cool stuff and that I never would have thought to make, and to get to feel that little bit of, oh, cool, I made that happen. I get to take the credit for this thing I would never have thought of. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm about. Hi, I'm uh, Natalie. I'm May I write about tools a lot and try to highlight them and on my blog, and uh, it's kind of become a passion of mine since I started working on the electric zine maker and people started sharing their own tools with me and I started seeing how much diversity and beautiful tools there are out there, really powerful ones too, like it's not, it's not small and it's a very underrepresented space that I feel more people should know about because like stated earlier, that it's really sad that uh, places, uh, large corporations like Unity or even Adobe with what they did with Flash get to make these decisions and just pull the plug on so much beautiful work and history. And yeah, it's, th that's kind of the, been the trajectory of my interest in this topic is that um, there are so many alternatives out there, but they don't get enough attention. Yeah. Yeah, uh, for me it was the unfortunate story of trying to make games and then getting too much into the tooling and then never finishing the game, <laughs> which I'm sure a lot of you can relate. Uh, but yeah, I also had a, a similar experience to, to the Unity thing that happened before when I was making games, the tool I was using suddenly changed the license. It wasn't like the single thing anymore that you paid and you could use. You had to pay a subscription and many things. It was like, okay, like, let's do open source stuff. And I started making my own tools. I tried to make my own version of like an open source game engine kind of thing. And then I found that people were already doing that and they were like a million times more talented. <laughs> so it was like, okay, I think I can help with this. And I got involved with open source in everything I could. And I think like since then I've been trying to help like not only in Godot, but in, in other areas wherever I can. So, so yeah. Right, thank you. So. First of all, I would like to ask you, are the developers, because we have been using, especially Unity, for a long time, a lot of developers, a lot of like, there was a years in a maze where all the games, or like most of the games were made in Unity. Are we able to move away? Do you think it is possible for us as an industry and for people as individuals, like individual developers, to actually move away? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I, I think we can, and I think we're seeing it. But it, of course, takes a lot of time. Like since the Unity thing happened until now, there's a lot of people trying to make that change. But the industry is already very set in stone. Kind of like publishers are very used to working with Unity. Like the, if you look for a job in the industry, you of course need to learn something like Unity or Unreal. So that's I feel is kind of like the chicken and egg problem of what comes first, right? Like if we everybody now decides to use custom stuff, then all the industry, how it is set up at the moment, cannot take that, right? So it's going to be a slow change, uh, but I think we can, just need to be patient. I think it's also like the industry itself, or like there's multiple use industries that use Unity, and there's even within the games industry, there's many different games industries that only vaguely interact with each other. So I think, you know, uh, translate, getting one, one part of that to suddenly switch to something else, yeah, that, that's fine. Getting everything to switch away from it, that, that's harder. But also, you know, maybe if you're trying to make a, ver a new thing, you don't start by saying, right, this is going to be the best thing for every single part of the games industry. You start with, oh, this is better than Unity for the thing it's doing. And then you can expand from there. I like that. But do you also think that it's worth it? It's worth it for 
developers that are hobbyists to pursue another solutions? Is it worth it for companies? Is it worth it for a developer to actually, you need to go out of your zone of something that you know and learn something else? Is that something that's worth it? I think um, if you are a smaller developer, there's a type of obligation to your own work that you have to try because I think people forget how much power small developers have in making these engines popular. Like, I mean, Unity became a big deal because of indies. It wasn't the first choice of AAA, you know? And I think when it comes to this stuff, we it would be wise to be conscientious about the types of engines we choose and we platform because we're also creating our own future in doing that. So I think for me, seeing what Unity is doing, this is the second time that I've seen this. Like I mentioned Flash earlier, you know? And I think it's really hard to constantly watch this circle repeating. And um, at this point, we have alternatives that are really good. And the more people that use them, the more powerful they can become. Uh, yeah, I mean, I also am an old person. Um, and so I came into the industry when Flash was still around and kind of on its way down. And I learned Unity in like whilst everyone else was still using Flash and then everyone was being very sad about like Flash declining as a platform and complaining about having to learn Unity. But the main thing I took away from that is, oh, don't ever like let your skills get entirely stuck onto one platform. Don't get to the point where the only way that you can survive as a programmer is by using this one thing that you've put all of your eggs into. Um, and you know, and now it's like 10 years later and I'm like, oh, Good. I'm glad I paid attention to that advice at that point, because now the unity is crashing and burning. I feel less like, oh, damn, I'm trapped with this thing, which has suddenly gone to shit. Um, yeah. All right. So, but if this is a question uh, to Natalie, if somebody wants to move away and start look for something new, where should they look? Oh, um, there's this wonderful uh, directory of tools by Everest called the Tiny Tools Directory. You could Google that. And there is was also more recently with the last Unity debacle uh, engine database put out. Uh, I think it's just called the Game Engine Database. Um, but there are initiatives to round up this stuff and uh, highlight it. All right. And to move forward, what makes a game tool, because there are many of them. There are the databases you can go and Google. If you go to GitHub and look for a game library or game engine, you probably will find a lot. Some of them probably have no documentation. Some of them are probably made by a person for the person that made it. But what makes a good game making tool? What makes a good engine? What makes the tool, the engine, something that other people will be willing to use? What, what is needed there? Yeah, for me, I feel like one important thing, at least for me, right, it's the ownership. Like, if you're going to be dependent on that person, like, again, that's why we advocate for open source licenses, that you can own that code. But also, the level of users there are, that also helps a lot, right? If you're going with a tool that nobody is documenting or using is going to be harder, which if you're technical, you can maybe overcome by reading it or trying to figure it out. But like looking where the community is usually point, points you into where those resources are. So if you open YouTube now and you search for anything like in game dev, you will find alternatives and kind of depends on to a little bit of personal experience into which tools you're going to be using if they work for your projects or not. But yeah, it, it's a bit complicated sometimes to bet on these smaller tools if they don't have any documentation, if they don't have like pretty images advertising it. But I feel like that's where less technical people can actually contribute to those tools, right? Like it's not only like contributing code in these sort of scenarios, but also like creating yourself the documentation. Like in the tools I make, I don't document. I don't have time for that but people come and they make documentation and that's what actually like makes it more accessible for everyone else so yeah there are different ways to to find and, and contribute there I'm, i mean i think 
a thing I'm kind of aware of is that all of the people here on stage are people who write code. Um, and actually, this is something I think about a bunch because Downpour is explicitly designed for people who don't write code. Like, if you, if you can write code and if you're comfortable making web pages, then making the kinds of things you can make in Downpour is really simple. You can, you can do that. You don't need Downpour. But you might choose to use it because it means that you can make stuff without having to think about code. And I think that that's a large proportion of the people who are developing games or working in the games industry, like, are people who are less technical. And I think a really important thing that game engines do is allow those people to make, you know, complicated, weird bits of software without having to understand how to code or without having to understand all of the complexities of coding. And I think solving that problem is a, is a huge thing that an engine does. Um, yeah. All right. But when you create those, when you create those tools, when you make them, I mean, I, I made an engine for my game, but I made it for me. What is the difference in making the engines just for yourself, making the things for yourself and making it for everyone. What, what do you need to keep in mind when you want to create, when you want to contribute and create something that people will use? I would very much love to have the thing that I made out there, but you are the people who already made it, so this is the question for you. You, you made the tools that are out there. Yes, I'm I like, yeah. Emilio and <laughs> um, I think the diff uh, so making downpour it felt more like making a game than it did making an engine because so much of it was about that oh how do you build the UI how do you explain all of this stuff how do you provide feedback for how people are doing stuff and like I Nathalie's like electric zine maker for example goes even further with that in terms of being just a pleasurable rich thing to use um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think that's that's part of the point. It's like the putting yourself in the in the shoes of the person who's using it and saying, okay, how can I? It's just the classic thing of you make a video game and it's like, oh, I have to explain all of this random stuff I've made up. It's exactly the same thing. Right. I, I think it's an interesting uh, question, or like even if you look at how rich and diverse that space is, because everyone that makes their own engine brings their own priorities and what they think a game is, and sh you know what a pr how to prioritize making a game into that, and like each one ends up being completely wildly different and enabling different types of games or empowering different types of creativity. Like you'll have. Uh, G develop, which is no code and it's very 2D. You have Rogue Engine, which is um, Unity-like environment for web games. You know, like each of these people that develop this, they had their own what they want to empower. And I think when you so when you're choosing a tool, I think you kind of have to think about what type of game you want to make and choose the tool that fits that because I think we kind of got very used to tools that are one and all solutions, which I think uh, it's nice, but also it's created this unhealthy dependence on them where if we maybe branched out and tried different things, we would have a more diverse space and empower the tool creators to make better tools, you know, um, yeah, I, I'm getting off on a tangent there, but yeah, I think you kind of have to look at what kind of game you want to make. Yeah, I think like jumping on that is very clear when you see something like RenPy, which is made for visual novels, like it's very, if you're making a visual novel, you go with RenPy, right? And I think that that's what you actually, if you want your tool to get more popular or like grab the attention, you need to explain the use case of that very well. Like I really like your talk about your engine because you cover all the parts that how you can run that code even in very ancient machines and all that. So if you are looking for making a game like that, that's a perfect tool to use that, right? So I think, yeah, with the general purpose engines like Godot, there's a little bit of a problem here because everybody wants it to be everything. And an engine cannot be everything very well. It will be OK at a lot of things. But if you really have something in mind from the beginning, then going with a specialized tool make more sense. And you know that's why we need more of these alternatives. Like, it's not like healthy to have only one piece of software that everybody is depending on and everybody tries to make it fit into whatever shape they want like uh, that's the cool thing about 
sharing these sort of tools. Like this worked for me. If you want to continue with it, you can continue for these sort of games. But the case needs to be very clear into the purpose of the engine. I, I think a trend, I'm, I don't know if this is a trend or maybe I'm just starting to notice it, but a thing that seems really encouraging and good is, I guess, the rise of stuff where there's particular solutions that can work in multiple engines or in multiple situations. I guess I'm thinking of Ink, and it's like, oh, hey, here's this thing that's really good for making branching dialogue, and it runs, and it can export to a web player, and it can also get embedded into a bunch of different engines. And so if you know how Ink works, then you can use it in a bunch of these different contexts. Or um, again, Nathalie, I know you're doing some cool stuff in terms of embedding various things into various other things. <laughs> Yeah, um, I kind of like the goal of what I'm working on now at Blue Suburbia, like this, it's artistic, interactive poetry, but I'm putting a lot of effort into making stuff in other tools and forcing whatever I made to work inside of Unreal. Like, I, I get that I could make a Bitsy-like thing in Unreal, but the point is to get Bitsy to work in Unreal or get... Pico 8 running in Unreal or, you know, like all this other stuff because I think it's it's brings an interesting texture to your project, but also it just makes, it, I, you know, like it, there's this part of it that's where it gives nod to all these other tools and how beautiful and diverse the work is because of those tools. It, one thing that you mentioned that uh, I would like to elaborate on is the uniqueness of using different tools. Does using a tool bring a flavor to the game? It's like, I mean, people used to call Unity games, say, uh, say it as a genre. Obviously, there are many games. Well, downpour games are definitely a genre, but that's a different kind of tool. But even with general purpose tools like Unity, Unreal, Godot, do you think they bl bring something like a flavor to the game that that making dif using different ones will bring more variety and uniqueness into the games that we make. Well, yeah, definitely, because I think every tool excels at a certain aesthetic, which I think that's really precious about them. Like, I mean, Bitsy is a very small tool, and it's definitely not going to compete with Unity ever, but it's so iconic now, and you'll see a Bitsy game, you know right away it's Bitsy. And uh, Pico 8, a really specific and unique style that's associated with it. But also, I think it's beautiful how people t run with Pico 8 or Bitsy and push it to be something totally else, like bringing color to Bitsy, 3D to Bitsy, uh, 3D to B Pico 8, Doom running in Pico 8. You know, like you, you look at Pico 8, you don't think it would ever support Doom. No, well, there was, you know, Doom running in it. You know, so I think it's. It's kind of like this uh, feedback loop. A tool empowers the creator. The creator runs with the tool and pushes the tool to new heights that the tool is not meant to be. The person making the tool sees that and uh, incorporates that or starts supporting that, you know, and it's this uh, beautiful upward spiral that happens, and specifically, I feel like, in uh, this independent tool space. Yeah, and I think that's why it's very important that these tools that we based our projects on are open source because you can actually then modify everything you need to modify for, you know, when you already get to the limit, then you can continue extending and you're going to be owning everything that you're making. But if you do that in a proprietary engine like Unity, like you, there's a limit in what, how much you have to, like how much you can modify, right? Of course, you can always pay to get more, as always. But like for me, was one of the games I made that was like the engine had a limitation that I couldn't like bypass at all. It was just not possible. So I had to create another program that was running at the same time to do some of the things. It was a mess. And if I had that opportunity, then it would have been great to continue extending the tool. And then if you want to share it with everybody and people want to use it, you know that that's nice. But. Yeah, you, you need access to everything if you really want to go the extra mile. I think there's also something really beautiful about when, uh, yeah, a tool has particular limitations and then people just see that as a challenge in terms of doing that or in terms of, yeah, doing something that doesn't seem technically possible or doing something that feel, has, a, has a feel to it that you wouldn't expect from that tool. And yeah, I think sometimes it can be generative. Like those limits can be generative because people just see it as a challenge and decide to do it anyway out of spite. 
um, which feels just as generative as like coloring within the lines. <laughs> so I, I also like what, what you said, uh, that creating a tool is like creating a game. So do you think as tool creators, are you also, are we also artists is making ga tools, like making games, does it make us the artist, the kind of tech artist of tools? Is that, is that something that happens? That, that's, that's how I feel about it, yeah. And I think the, you know, that thing of like, oh, a particular, particular engine, a particular tool, like gives a flavor to the types of things that are made with it. Like that f feels super interesting to me. Like you're making this even kind of minor choice about how a thing is framed or presented and then that, that changes the things that people make with it. And then that changes, you know, like, I don't know, thousands of bits of work. Like, that's, that's really cool. Um. I mean, I think this is really interesting conversation point, too, because there's such a rich history and software history where people viewed tools as art, like KidPix, Mario Paint, uh, the early Microsoft software used to actually be creative, you know? Because uh, it software wasn't so defined, and I think we've kind of surrendered control of what software is to larger corporations that get to define what software is, and it's this dead, cold, highly functional space where it shouldn't have been, and it didn't need to evolve that way. And I think there's this um, wonderful kind of a counterculture where tools are creative, tools are art, tools making art should can be made inside of someone else's art. And uh, the most qualified people to make tools are people that make games because you understand what a game is and how a game is. And I, you know, I think it's beautiful when even the tool itself can push against what software is and how defined that ended up becoming. Yeah, I really like your responses, so nothing to add. But I wanted to comment on the logo of our engine, which is, I believe, fun and friendly and, you know, nice. And everybody, like, on the professional side hates it. It's like, you should make one that's more professional. And by professional, I guess they mean, like, a squared white and black and white logo that, you know, like, you can do on one of those, I, I don't know, like, images. But it's like your you have two sort of users, the users that really like the weird stuff. If you add sounds to the UI, they will love it. And you, you know, you're going to have all those nice interactions and animations. And then there's the users that just, just want a tool and they want to do you know, things and they want to feel professional. And yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like there is a little bit of art in making these tools and, and being a little bit more playful. At the end of the day, we're making games. It's not like we're making spreadsheets. Unfortunately, making games is a lot of spreadsheets, <laughs> but but yeah, like the tool itself, right? Like I I really like that there's a little bit more color or things like that, and it's slowly fading away. Everything looks the same. Everything has same sort of like identity, and I don't know. I think we can be a little more fun with it. Yeah. But also, like that kind of fun is is part of the design of the thing as well. Like you know, downpour is the all the UI is like pastel colors, and it's all very clicky and like. That's a deliberate thing. It's just trying to signal, hey, you don't have to be serious to make something with this. It's friendly and available for you. When I made a previous tool, Cheatbots Done Quick, uh, I, it, to do that, you had to write JSON code. You had to write JSON in order to define the thing. But I tried very carefully not to frame it as, oh, you need to write JSON. Like, the editor was deliberately not in monospace, because I knew if it was monospace, a bunch of the people who wanted to use it would come, look at it, and go, oh, it's code. I can't do that, and go away again. So it was like, oh, no, no, no. How, can I, how can I soften it? How can I make it friendly to these other people? How can I make it open to these other audiences? And like, you know, like it's a thing where it's like, oh, oh like the color choice is actually a really key load-bearing part of this game engine design. I don't know. That's <laughs> I, I like what you said uh, about the like serious game corporations being mad at Godot logo. Like, how can we put our serious game about zombies and tanks into this? <laughs> but to follow up on the previous question, uh, do you, as the creators of the tools, feel a part? Feel? Do you feel that there's a, there is a part of you in the things that the people create? Do you think that you are like kind of a co-creator of the things that the users of your tool make. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, 
like yes, yes and no. Like it's uh, yeah. I mean, like I, I said, kind of in my intro, like I feel like I get to have a little bit of a like yes, you wouldn't have made this without me. I get to take some of the credit, but at the same time, also it's it's their thing, um, and I don't want to take that away from them. But I don't know. Like, but it's exactly the same as like I don't know. You you host a game jam and people make some cool games. Like, did you make those games? No, but you get to feel some credit for bringing people together. You get some credit, some credit. Like again, I've like organized events and like you make something like a maze happen and some really cool stuff happens. People meet each other. Stuff happens as a result of that. You get to feel pride for that impact, but you didn't necessarily make the games, you know, it's, it's I, I think this is kind of interesting because like when I first released the zine maker, you know, like I thought, okay, whatever, no one's going to use this. It's too weird. And people started using it and I kind of, panicked quietly thinking, oh God, they're making art in it. Like it's, it's such a responsibility now. People are using this to make things and be productive, you know, and like it's, it, it was quite a rush because I think a lot of how Electric Z Maker turned out and it was a response to how people were using it, you know, like it was my vision for it, but also how weird and funny people were being with it and uh, how they were pushing it on all these silly directions, you know, so I don't, it's kind of like asking where to start chicken or egg, you know, it's kind of, you're really very informed by the people that use the tool with how you end up making it. Yeah, I, I definitely feel it. And I think that's the only rewarding part because my game never comes out, but the game that people are making with my tools come out, that's great because it's like, yeah, it, it works. I hope, right, for them. But, but yeah, no, I really, really like it that, you know, we're like quoting one of my colleagues, Remy, like we're kind of creating these pencils and canvas for them to use. And then you feel very proud that they were able to do it thanks to you. Uh, but of course, you know that they did it. They did the hard thing, right? Like they did the actual game itself. But it's nice to feel like part of that process, right? Like we don't think about how nice Bill Gates must feel when we are using Windows, right? But for a lot of people, especially in games, like if that didn't happen, you couldn't be running this software on top of that. Same with Linux or the rest, right? So I, I would like to take a little bit of credit in when people use my tools. <laughs> Rightly so. <laughs> uh, to kind of elaborate on that, do you think like there's kind of a resurgence of games, resurgence like a, uh, there are more games that are kind of not really games, but was also tools. There was this game where you could build like a tiny village on an island. There's the My Summer House game where you like you just arrange a house, and the uh, the Cozy Cove game where you like you put ruins in a cozy cove is coming out soon. Do you think the, that more of these will become popular? And do you think that? the line between the tool, like even with like big stuff, like I don't know, Roblox, the line between the tool and the game will become to blend more and more with like creators making games that are also tools and adding tools to their games to like modify their games. I think that's really interesting. Like a long time ago when I was making Everything is Going to Be Okay, I put in some art tool things in the game because you know, whatever creative outlet from playing this thing. And it was so interesting to see how much that meant to people and how they got carried away in making things that were actually good in those silly little things. And uh, I think there's this kind of untapped space of that you can explore as a game developer where it really means a lot to people to be creative and to be empowered to be creative in unusual, weird, silly little ways, you know? and. Um, we see this be mildly successful or mildly successful in really goofy ways. Like, you know, uh, I think it's called sock puppets or, yeah, you know, like it's so silly, but it means so much to people. And, uh, you know, I think it's kind of, I think it's a beautiful thing to watch this grow and more people realizing, oh, players like doing this. Yeah, let's be, let them be creative because like, People love playing, and play is creative. And there's that beautiful intersection there that I think is not explored enough. I, I have a less uh, uplifting answer to that, uh, which is that 
from poking around a bit, I can see that venture capitalist firms are very interested in uh, game platforms and UGC and all of that kind of category. Um, and obviously, like making downpour, I was like looking out, like, oh, hey, what, what tools are there for making games on phones? And there's a bunch that are in development and are like very venture capital backed and are like gunning for Roblox. So I think it's like a thing. There's a bunch of these that are going to launch. I think there's a big, going to be a big push of large amounts of money into this kind of game tool make a thing and share it online with your friends type thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously that stuff is going to be have a different vibe to the stuff that we're discussing on stage here. Um, but then also, I think it's also worth pointing out, you know, like The Sims is one of the biggest games of all time. And that's basically just to like make your own house. That's that's a big part of that game. Um, like a load of the stuff that people like, you know, people playing um, Baldur's Gate 3. How much time did people spend doing the character creator? Like it, it's already like some of the biggest games are half just little creation tools where you can play around with the tools and make a cool thing. So I think it's already there. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And yeah, I think that the cool thing about these custom tools that we are able to make and distribute now very easily is that with the technology we have today, we, you can realistically make a game with your own hardware. You don't really need very expensive stuff. You can, there's a lot of accessibility in there. And that allowed a lot of people to create new ideas that otherwise would have not been funded, right? Like in any game that gets funded, you, so, you solve every problem by killing stuff, shooting stuff, right? Like it's always kind of like this mechanic and giving these tools for people to make other sort of games. We're starting to see this other sort of kind of creative takes on the, on the game itself. So I think like, yeah, it is very interesting that we can see more of those things thanks to the tools that are enabling these creators to make a game about ruins, right? Like there, there isn't any rule that you have to actually be killing stuff in a game, but most games that get funded are like that. So uh, having free and available tools for everybody allows people to create different things. And I think in the end, we're gonna be seeing different sort of games being made. Thanks to that. I like that. It's like countering the games that are about destructions with the games that are about creation. Just flipping this around. I, I really like this approach. Uh, so I would like to look back into not making, but using tools. Because I guess most of the audience, like we are here creating the tools, uh, but most of the people are just using the tools that we and others create. And I would like to uh, give a moment to talk about how to, how to find a tool that you need and what is something that you need to look out for when, when choosing one for your game. I think the best is a recommendation, asking people you know, and if you have someone that can guide you by using that tool, it's, it's a good start. But it's a very difficult question. <laughs> I think I think one part that doesn't. I think it's quite often that people find the tool and then decide to make the game afterwards. Um, like, yeah, like I don't know. Some, sometimes you start and you're like, oh, I want to make a game and it's going to work these ways. And here's the important part about it. Okay, what's the right? Here's here's a bunch of choices that I've got kind of in front of me. What's the kind of thing there? But uh, definitely from the downpour end, it's as much like, oh. Let me mess around with this. Oh, this could be funny. And even the process of making a game is more, let me mess around with this. Oh, this could be funny than it is often. OK, he, we've got a plan. Let's execute this plan. Um, yeah, I don't know. So I think as much it's you go, oh, hey, I want to learn Unity. And then you start messing around with Unity. Oh, hey, I want to learn Godot. And then you start with a like tutorial example and then you change some stuff and then you're like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Um, like, I, I bet that there's games out there that have been released to success that definitely started that way, right? Yeah. Oh, um, I think it's also interesting when you look at how, when you're choosing this stuff, like, uh, what I, li I like looking at is how long it's been in produ being developed. Uh, is it being regularly developed? And how many are people still using this? And how, like, how alive is the tool? Because like, there are a lot of tools out there that kind of just you know die or be are discontinued or branch off into other directions. So yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, I will add to that. Uh, you also need to look at, at the license. Like you want to have, hey, you want to have control of the source code. So you want something like MIT license, BSD license. Uh, you do not want something like GPL license because you could use like a Doom engine for your game. I mean, you could, but then you would have to release the source code for your game, and that is something to keep in mind because GPL is a license that that forces you to do that. And one other thing that I always look at when I choose like a library, a tool, uh, and a thing for my game is not only not only the licenses but patents. I am like. I feel like the patents, software patents, are the worst thing that happened to the software industry. They should have been banned. They should not exist. Imagine that you wrote a piece of code at home, and it's the same or does the same thing as someone else's who patented it, patented it and you didn't even see it, but you will have to pay that person. It does not make sense in the slightest. And there are many many libraries that are use code that are patented. Like one big example is uh, Monogame. Monogame uses Mono, and Mono uses C-sharp.net, which is patented by Microsoft. Microsoft granted the patent to Mono, but in the patent grant it says that it's a promise. Microsoft says it promises not to sue you if you use Mono. So is that is that a legal term? Is that something that you need to look at? Uh, and I, I think often with these things, when it comes to patents or when it comes to this kind of situation, it's often a situation where it's like, if enough people are using it, then you feel a bit safer because it's like, well, if they have to sue half the games industry, then I'm not going to be on the top of the pile. But if you're doing something where it's like similarly dodgy terms or something like that, and you're the only person using it, then you're more exposed. I mean, didn't enough people use Unity? <laughs> right, like if, if it turns out that Unity is violating some pattern and then someone tries to sue everyone who's made a Unity game, like, you're probably okay, like, practically speaking. <laughs> like, Unless uh, the license is from Nintendo, right? Like, then... Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, also, what do you think about using multiple? Like, I mean, when you're making a game game uh, and you're looking around for libraries and engines, wh what do you think about using m multiple tools? Is that something viable to, to take, like, I don't know, two of them and parts of that? Is that something that you think people could and should do? I mean, I, I've done this now and uh, it's something you do because you're passionate about it. I wouldn't really suggest doing it because it's a better way of doing it. You know, I think it's more a statement or what it represents and the trying to find harmony between all these tools and how they could be used together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I think sometimes it makes sense if, for instance, you're using a general purpose engine like Godot and you're making a game that's very heavy on tiles on a tile set or anything like that you might find some limitations in the one we ship built in. And then there's a great tools like Tiled, which are very good for making those sort of things. And then you can combine them. And the cool thing about those, if they are popular, is that somebody else already did the integration. So you don't need to do anything, right? <laughs> like you don't need to go crazy with, with it. So you can use multiple tools. And you know, Blender itself, like for making models, probably is what you're going to be using. You're not going to be making models in the game engine kind of thing. So it's like the collection of tools that you end up using that I think Makes makes it also like better at what they are doing, like each on each on each area. Yeah, so. and I think also if you're like using tools where they are open source, then the boundaries of the tool can be a bit fuzzier. Like um, I know there's some like not actually doing it, but I'm following like the Rust game uh, game engine scene, and there it's like, oh hey, there's the Bevy project which is developing the Bevy engine, but it's pulling in a load of packages from elsewhere in the ecosystem, and it. Also, you're like, oh, hey, we want to use this thing, or oh, hey, you want to integrate a different physics engine into this. OK, yeah, that's, that's possible. Or someone's done this integration, or it's, you know, the, the, the boundaries are much fuzzier, um, often with open source, because you don't need to make a definitive statement like, this is the thing we've licensed, and this is the thing that's been bundled in. It's like, oh, no, 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 OK, well, change this package, or fork this, or. 
Yeah, and I'm surprised that that's not more the norm in the gaming industry. Before I was working professionally on the web, and in the web everything is open source for that reason, right? Like everybody's picking stuff from different places and sharing it. And also the, the capitalist answer to this is that you can continue working with the same technologies when you move to another company, right? If you, <laughs> but um, I feel like with the games now, like with the gaming industry is like starting to realize the value of having these sort of different options being available to everybody. And that's thanks to, to the open source nature of it. And it's quite new, unfortunately. There isn't too many yet, but I hope that there will be more Okay, and one final question is, do you think for a game tool, for a game engine to become popular, does it need a visual editor? Is that something that's really necessary for people? I mean, yeah, I think you have to keep uh, lower tech people in mind because artists are incredibly important and uh, a lot of people get into games because they don't know how to code, but they're good at art or they are not good at art, they're good at music, and they create their games based around, you know, their lack of knowledge, and it helps not, it helps not being forced just to code. I think you lose a lot if it, you're just forced to code. Like, I've watched, or when I, when I was starting out, it was really hard to, you know, constantly be pushed into the box of, no, you have to be a programmer, you have to be a programmer, and it's extremely difficult to do that when you're good at art and yeah i think you really have to care about low tech people i i actually surprisingly well i mean it's again it's like for for, for who for what for I, but i think there's perfectly successful things that can be that and i think uh, yeah i don't know like a visual editor is great and obviously it's i really care about making tools which mean that people who don't have those technical skills can do that but at the same time also it's much easier to make a like game engine if you're not building the call editor thing there and you know like from from your side i i just assuming here I'm assuming that the engine you've built that supported all these things does not have a visual editor for working in. Correct. Um, so if you're building it, building something for yourself, or if you're building something for these kind of specialist purposes, then yeah, like you're solving that particular problem, you're aiming for that particular niche, and I don't think you need to to do that. Um, or or maybe you, you oh hey it's a thing you're making games that are based on tiles, and tiled is your visual editor and everything's built into the game runtime, so you've got some debugging stuff there, and actually so it patches together without needing it. I don't know. There's lots of different ways to, to cut it up. Um, but yeah, also, there's something really powerful about building stuff so that people who do not have the same skills you have can still make really cool stuff. Yeah, everything was mostly covered. Yeah, like it depends on what you define as making it popular. Like there were a lot of popular, like like I don't know, like XNA or like you know, you have Lua now on Love to D for Balatro, for instance. It's just code, right? Um, I think it depends on the public. But the more accessible you make it, the more people can get included into the process, and they can make better things. I wouldn't be able to program if there wasn't like easy to use tools at the beginning that kind of taught me the way of navigating that and then translating that to code when I was more advanced. So if you want to get new people in, I think the easiest way is to give them those sort of tools. And if you want to get the old school in, I think like just code, it's, it's, it's enough. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's an interesting uh, conversation too because uh, I've seen a lot of online conversations about how the bar for entry into programming or game making feels like often it's getting higher and higher, especially for websites where you now need all sorts of licenses and all sorts of knowledge to make do something basic where you used to just be able to make a flash game and put it online you know so i think it's if you are doing tools independently it matters to think about who you lock out or exclude because of technical things you know and uh, you, we can't lose the next generation of game developers or programmers because we're so locked into our own languages and uh, idea of how something should or shouldn't be technical. Yeah, with languages as well, the localization is important, right? Like having to learn English first, it's also a big barrier for a lot of people. Like that's what happened to me. Kind of had to learn both at the same time. 
and you know now you can use most of the tools localized by the community into different languages and that's making it easier for a lot of people so there's so many factors thank you i actually wanted to follow up with a question about keeping in mind how to empower the artist with the tools you're creating to you kind of went there and answered, but if you have anything to add? Um, I, th well, I, I think it's interesting when you look at uh, open source stuff and this freedom to create and how uh, larger companies are, where they're taking tools or game development tools like uh, Roblox, yeah. Um, it's with the stuff you create is basically also behind a walled garden. App Store is a walled garden. It's 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 also a walled garden. And like when I came, when I started, it was free. You just made something, you posted it, and people could play it, and you had control of your outlet. Where it seems like now, more mainstream stuff is leaning in the direction of controlling outlet for emerging or new people in games like Roblox. You know, and I think. I, I don't know if this is too much of a tangent, but I think it's important to think about low-tech people because their option is something that is easy to you know, make something in, but they're not thinking about how we used to be able to just share stuff and own our stuff, you know? All right, okay, thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you, and this is where you clap. <laughs>I would say the closest I feel is each IO in terms of like having a place where people can upload their stuff. It's not the same technology what people upload there, but it's getting more and more easy to do web stuff. But I don't think that there's anything that's ever going to be like Flash. It was a thing that happened in a very specific moment and yeah, it's gonna be difficult to recreate something like that. That was a very sad answer. <laughs> We're sorry. <laughs> I'm trying. Like, but like that's that's part of like you know like downpour is like oh hey can we make something and she, and again it's like there's an important thing there you share it it's a thing on the web you can visit it like but yeah like the death of Flash and moving to HTML5 like technically had the capabilities but didn't have any of that same accessibility and it just killed it also but Flash was also about the way that people went to those Flash portals and would play games there and were used to playing stuff that had that was short and had that kind of pace and now stuff has shifted onto phones which people are using recreation in that same way and there's just not the same ability to have the same ecosystem there instead it's all be like gobbled up by free-to-play mobile games which is just a completely different scene and yeah i mean i'm also sad <laughs> Hi, uh, first of all, I just want to say, uh, and I probably speak for a lot of people here, uh, thank you so much for making these amazing things, engines and tools. Uh, I enjoy using them uh, and punishing myself by using them. Um, I'm in games education. I feel like uh, it's more and more common for people to come to games through like educational programs. And I think that educational programs in games sort of bear a lot of the responsibility for certain engines being uh, more uh, predominant, like more commonly used. I know I struggle when I plan like the semesters because we have to put the cart before the horse and say, well, we have a teacher, that teacher knows Unreal. So we're going to do Unreal games, I guess, <laughs> right? So I'm just uh, curious if you've uh, collaborated with um, schools uh, at any level 
and what some of your thoughts are about like uh, how schools influence the use of engines. I was I was teaching in a university uh, at one point, and one thing that I did te teach kids is how to write a game on a Commodore 64, how to write a game in Turbo Pascal in DOS, how to write a game using C, because all of the courses back then were using Unity, and I was like, you gotta learn different things. You gotta learn that this wasn't there at all times, and this might not be here in the future, and you need to know the basics. And I thought like, yeah, it's, it's simple enough. You might think that Commodore 64 or MS-DOS were like complicated machines with very high entry level, but they, they were just simple machines. So the entry level compared to what we have now, if you want to make a 3D game, is much, much lower. So that was not something very barring for them, I feel. And I feel a lot of schools should do that, teach the history of the tools of the games to make the games that we make now. Yeah, from from the Godot side, we talk with a lot of teachers that they want to start teaching that, but there's some expectations that we cannot meet. For instance, a lot of universities got like the Unity guy knocking at the door, giving them all the resources and everything, right? Like, all the money is kind of there, and we don't have those sorts of resources, and it's kind of difficult to kind of break into the first generation of people that will be learning this and then will be using it in the future. And that's sort of the same model that Adobe did with all their software, right? They kind of teach you that on the university, then you are dependent on them. And when you go solo, you do stuff, you kind of need to pay their licenses. So it is very complicated and something that we don't know still how to fix. But hopefully with now more awareness, people are trying other tools. You know, like there's more and more free and open source engines that people can learn and then can teach that I think it will change. But it's it's a difficult problem because there isn't a lot of monetary incentives on the first level of it. So you need a lot of investment from the outside to start growing that base. And nobody wants to give money for that at the moment. I mean, DAMP has been out like, what, like a couple of months, and I think it has been taught at universities already. Uh, so yeah, just, just try making something that's incredibly simple and doesn't actually need any resources because there's not that much you can do with it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, It's really cool to see, and it's really cool to see people teaching with it and it being useful in that kind of way. Um, I don't know, I, but I haven't really gotten any resources or useful things to hand out. Possibly that's something I should look at, but I every time I think like this is this is the classic like I don't know problem my pro mental problem for me where every time I'm like oh maybe this is confusing I should think of something to explain it I'm like no I should fix it so the thing is less confusing in the app itself which is obviously much more difficult and less likely to happen but you know that's that's what my heart drives me towards. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, we had one more question over here. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I've been advocating for free software for, I don't know, like a decade or more. Uh, and it's been a very interesting journey. Um, and throughout the journey, I encountered generally two ways with, that people um, uh, answer to me. Uh, what I mean is some people use free software because they love the, philo the philosophy, the politics, and they're like, yeah, I'm just going to use this because I want to. And some people are more pragmatic, and they say, I would only use it if it's better than the proprietary uh, software, right? Um, have you encountered the same? And have you seen this change, especially recently? Have we learned more about the philosophy or the politics and how we see now what's happening? We saw the, what happened with Flash, right? We understood why it happened, because it was proprietary and a closed wall garden. Um, is it still relevant to learn about the philosophy? And if so, um, uh, I think a way to protect the, this much of culture from being lost, like it like has been, is to make those uh, engines free and open source, right? Free, I mean, as in uh, freedom, not just free beer. Um, sorry, I'm rambling a bit. <laughs> what I mean is, yeah, like that. Um, how important it is to, to understand these politics and to keep talking about them. Uh, how important it is to use the engines that are uh, free and open source. I'm looking, I'm looking at you, Pico 8. Uh, I love Pico 8, I really do. Uh, is Pico 8 at risk of becoming a wall garden that might one day disappear, and with it all that culture? Um, 
and while I'm on the, on the microphone, when we, we understand free software for the engines, uh, but I don't see, I haven't seen this, this 10 years, I haven't seen an increase of games being made free and open source. And again, free is not like gratis, it means free as in freedom. Uh, you can still sell it. Um, what do you think that's the case? Thank you. Well, I think the problem with making games open source is that you cannot make the entire game open source because you are using you're most probably using things that you cannot make open source in your game. And then you have to wall them out or weed them out. So it might be easy to make it like 10 years later, like some games do. But when you're making it, you only have the resources to make the game, not the resources to help the humankind uh, from like a publisher or an, an investor. So it's like hard to, you would need extra resources and when you need those extra resources when you like when you're a company of 10 people you would need to add that in your budgeting and what kind of investor is going to do that they don't care about that they care about the game that you make and the game that will make money not the free things that you will give to community and i mean i can also say like downpour is not open source it's built with open source technology and i am appreciative of that um, part, a little bit of it's open source, like the thing where the thing that actually runs in a web browser when you play a downpour game, like that part is open source, and I very much encourage people to do weird stuff with that. Um, but the reason it's the reason large part of it isn't open source is mainly because I'm like, yeah, I don't really want other people to to, <laughs> to get involved. <laughs> like it's kind of like, oh, I, I've made this thing, I care about the thing, and trying to run it as a community and trying to encourage people to do stuff there feels difficult and not something I'm interested in. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's hypocritical of me, given that, again, it is built on a lot of... Everybody people. hates pull requests. <laughs> oh, um, for me, I, I struggle a little bit because uh, there's so much energy put into just making the thing, following up with the emotional energy of listening to people's uh, feedback for it, and... Uh, keeping up with de developing it and then also you know managing trying to manage a community that surrounds it in a healthy way so it's like it's a lot and i think if you start talking about open source it's really something you need a group of people for because like as an individual i it's yeah <laughs> there's only so much you can do and then you can get picked apart like balatro yeah. It's not even open source, it's just... Yeah. <laughs> for, for the beginning of it, I don't think the industry will ever care too much about open source. It's only like you need this critical mass of people that are actually passionate about it to promote it, to start using it. Then the rest will use it if it makes sense, kind of like Linux on the servers. Like business people don't care about Linux, they probably don't even know what it is. But if it's something that is able to run their businesses, they will use it. And if the tech guys are happy, they will also be using it. So I think it's more like getting that small critical mass first that then will influence the rest of the industry. I would love for everybody to care and to promote and to follow open source, open source but I think it's a little bit of a dream that, that that's the reality, so. All right. Okay, um, I mean, we're over time. However, um, oh gosh, we, we have some questions in the far back. We could do maybe two last questions, two short questions. Thank you. I'll make it very brief. Um, so you mentioned already that you believe in the future games will continue to be proprietary, but tools should be moving towards more of a like copyleft, open source, free software space. Um, you also sung the praises of uh, the GPL copyleft licenses, um, while uh, or uh, the other way around, you sung the, the praises of these uh, permissive licenses like the BSD license and the MIT license, while sort of denigrating a bit like the, the GPL license out of this um, fear of, of being forced to open source your game. I was wondering how you feel about like the middle ground of licenses, like the EUPL and the LGPL, which um, uh, requires you to open source any modifications being made to your tool without um, uh, forcing people to uh, make uh, the, the game that's including the tool uh, also proprietary. And as a small side note, um, th this contagion of the GPL, this is a common misconception, is not actually enforceable under EU law. 
uh, ju just for anybody who is curious. Oh, all right, so uh, I'm very I'm very careful when it comes, like I even mentioned patents, a lot of people just don't glance over it or don't check it out. I am very careful about having everything legally set in my games, and LGPL has GPL in the name, and doesn't that make it GPL compatible? So it, now it's GPL, and I'm just afraid. <laughs> Yeah, I think, yeah, jumping on that, like the difference and I mean, software can be GPL and be very popular like Blender, but it's just going to create more friction in the times of investing your time or like creating that critical mass because people are scared of the term and are more reluctant to, to use it. But I wish I didn't know what software licenses were. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. OK, last question. Uh, I, I wanted to ask, um, what are resources you think are needed for tool developers like yourselves to create these tools? Like from like some like a tour tools to more general purpose. Like you know, like if you're making a tool by yourself, you don't want to do community management. But then like if you're doing like a bigger thing, you maybe need funding. Like what are kind of resources that you personally feel are lacking for more people to be able to make more tools? Donations. Yeah, yeah, money, money is really helpful, I'd say. Um, <laughs> but I, I think actually there's another part. I mean, it, this is definitely coming from the like kind of creative tools, maybe more than engine side, which is like I feel like it is a interesting creative space which does not get talked about much and get talk. And I don't think there's as much of a scene of people talking about it in the same way that there's a scene of people talking about, you know, game design and all of that kind of stuff. And actually, that's something I'd really like to see more of. Um, we should start that podcast. I, I think credit, like I made a tool called Allegro JS, which is like an old Allegro library, but made in JS for people to make HTML5 games in. It's like absolutely free and people can use it whatever they want. But what a lot of games use it, like and, and mobile, but I only found out kind of randomly because you do not have to credit me. Well, you do not have to. I do not enforce that. But I wish more people did, and then more people would look at my thing, and then maybe I could marry, make more of these. Thanks to that. Uh, can we? Can yes. we take? There's this person in the first row who was had his hand up every single time. Oh, I did and not see you. I'm so <laughs> sorry. Um, okay. Well, the thing is, we are like, do you want to? Is it short? Is it real short? Short and sweet? It's, just, it's more of a fun, light question. Oh, uh, <laughs> um, so, you talked very briefly, I'll keep it very short, actually short. Uh, you talked about quirks in tools and engines, and I was wondering, like, if you develop things with Unity for a while and you play some games, you know, start to notice some patterns and some weird things that. You know, like the standard character controller. 3D. The window. Uh, exactly. Yeah, that, that also. But when you play it, that you're like, oh, yes, this is clearly a game made in this. Have any tools that you've made got to, have you seen these weird patterns, interesting patterns emerge in the things that have been made with your tools, like quirky things that are now part of what is a downpour game or a Godot game? Downpour is extremely limited, so yeah, like it, you can you can tell pretty much immediately. <laughs> in Godot, we give one icon, which is the icon that does VG that you have the sprite that you can use anywhere, and it's usually the placeholder for everything. And most people leave it kind of like as an Easter egg, they like just to use the icon on some enemy or on a, the room. So yeah, like it's the default kind of sprite. In Allegro JS, uh, I made a font specifically for that, and people do use that. And I think like including a free font with your engine is something that you will be able to see is like a watermark. <laughs> people like fonts. In an electric Z maker, there's an option to have cutting lines or fold lines in it, and people don't know that you can turn it off, so they leave it into the in their zines, and it's really obvious when it's made in an electric Z maker because of that. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for this beautiful panel. This was fantastic. Thank you.